On February 15th, the Michigan Gallery presented Raya Storr's 10-minute film, Here is the Imagination of the Black Radical, followed by a conversation with Dr. Keisha Allen. Storr is a London-based artist and filmmaker who explores the representation of black and mixed race cultures, often drawing from her British Bahamian heritage. She is interested in masquerade as a site of protest or subversion and how place or space affect cultural representation. She is currently undertaking a PhD and is co-director of Not Nowhere, an artist film cooperative in London that has a particular focus on analog film. She is a resident at Somerset House London and occasionally programs at Alchemy Film and Moving Image Festival. Dr. Allen is a professor at Baruch College specializing in 20th century Caribbean literature. She examines women writers who critique social and political inequities in their societies and how they create fictional worlds that have the effect of subverting patriarchal perspectives and paradigms in their post-colonial societies. She also interrogates society and artistic responsibility with women presented as creatively engaged in revolutionary activities aimed at reshaping ideas and perspectives in the national imaginary. In the film, Here is the Imagination of the Black Radical, not only does Storr celebrate the radical politics of Junkanoo, a form of carnival in the Bahamas, she also follows the Shell Saxon Superstars, one of the oldest Junkanoo groups in the Bahamas, to display Junkanoo as an expression of black creativity and resistance, a form of Afrofuturism conducted in the present. Here is the conversation. Okay. I truly enjoyed the film. Um, I think it captured the essence of Junkanoo. So I would start by asking about the origins of this project. What drew you to this project? Oh gosh. Um, well, my uncle actually used to be in the Shell Saxon Superstars who you see mostly in the parade and he made costumes for them for a long time. And it's one of the ways that I um, kind of connect to him when I see him. He lives in um, in Florida now. So one way for me to connect is by um, making costumes with him. And so that's something that we started doing together because I am interested in making and texture and material anyway. Um, and the film is actually made the first time that I got to see Junkanoo myself and it's very much from um, a diasporic point of view it's from me as somewhat of an outsider um, but also partially an insider um, looking at the carnival and thinking about how it's archived and how that um, that work doesn't get the same kind of treatment as the works that I um, reading about and learning about from my perspective here and what an avant-garde might be and that those ways of making that are in Junkanoo might be considered um, avant-garde basically be um, be framed within sort of a fine art context or might be um, revered in the same way. Oh no definitely and I think of the Junkanoo and I think of Trinidad Carnival. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. So there are so many connections. And again, it brings me back to my family as well. And seeing Carnival together, it was sort of something that brought the community together, the family together. So that I think is really important. Also, the film is captured using 16 millimeter film. Um, could you tell us about the selection of the 16 millimeter and why perhaps it's best suited for this type of project? Well, some of it is on 16 millimeter, but a lot of it is digital. And some of it is also, it's also been re-screened through um, a VHS player. So there's actually like several different modes of recording in there. And that was kind of the best um, way of working for me because I'm interested in how, how do I recall this event which is really a bodily experience and you have to be there to experience the the noise and the sounds and the just the sheer um excess and um spectacular 
the nature of Junkanoo? How do I then capture that on film? And I guess that's what I'm asking by using all of those different technologies, but also um, different technologies in recording as well. So you hear a lot of um, beeps and buzzes and the sounds of um, technology itself and static as well, which you both uh, see and hear. But the actual 16 millimeter film um, comes mainly in those blue flashes of light, which are kind of the imaginative, it's when imaginative activity is going on, when things are being created. That's when the um, sort of blue flashes appear, and that's a cyanotype. Um, so it's been exposed in the sun. Um, I've coated 60 millimeter film in a cyanotype wash and it's been exposed in the sun and it's just developed with uh, water and fixed with water. Um, and I was interested in a very like hands-on, very tactile experience of 60 millimeter that um, also you can see in the way that the costumes are made, the handling of crepe paper um, is very much an experience of working with your hands. Okay, great. Do we have any questions from the audience? Anyone has any questions? Okay. <laughs> what was that regard about public space? You don't want to go out of space or what's the year? It's anti ethos, anti modern. <laughs> okay, great. We have a question from the audience, and his question is what about um, it's sort of these anti space anti, anti auto space images and sounds and what and sort of anti musk um someone said as uh, he said as well if you don't want to be in mars you want to be here the afro future is here um could you talk a bit about that that um sort of the fact that you're looking at the afro future and saying it's not necessarily in the future it's here in this space of junkano yeah, so um, I guess I was tired of hearing um, Afrofuturist works which just talk about space as a kind of escapism. And the point of Afrofuturism to me is that it's able to speak to um, a moment or articulate a moment um, or a way that we live on Earth in a particular place or a particular time. And so um, it's kind of a paraphrase of a film by uh, Jim Coney called Space is the Place, which uh, Sun Ra, who is an um, enigmatic uh, jazz musician, um, very forward thinking and produces really unpredictable performances where his whole his orchestra would uh come into the audience and yes they were sort of um free in terms of the space that they occupied um so this film is about Sun Ra and in it Sun Ra is uh in space and he comes down to earth to Oakland California um to choose people to go back with him um into space so that's the meaning of space as a place, but people often um, appropriate it, I've noticed, um, just when they're talking about space. Mm -hmm. So they're really excited about space, and so they say space is a place. Um, seemingly benign, but I think it takes away the kind of impetus of space as the place. Was It was that um, Sun Ra was going to um, a black neighbourhood and seeing how the people lived there and um, the idea of going into space at that time and that space might be reserved um, just for African-Americans um, to occupy this like music um, environment on, on the moon or whatever was quite revolutionary really. Um, and so what I'm saying in the film is that when these kinds of escapist notions that we see, that we see even in the costumes that, that are um, present in Carnival, when these kinds of Afrofuturist um, aesthetics are employed, 
they should relate to a particular time and a particular place and be speaking to what's happening in that moment and should be um, uh, relevant to a culture or a politics in some way. Okay, oh, we have another question, yeah. Okay. Um, her question is, does the costume have symbolism or meaning for something? Is it representing something in particular with regards to what we saw um, in the film? Um, yes. Uh, I don't know what it's like in Trinidad. Uh, oh, you have Mirko Jumbies, maybe. But, um, you do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but in the Bahamas, it's very structured compared to other carnivals. So um, each group will have a theme and there has to be a synopsis written about it. There has to be um, a piece of text for each costume as well. Um, and all the costumes will relate to the theme. And there are judges walking up and down the parade route and they score um, the groups based on uh, different criteria, such as how well they meet the theme, so how well they're able to represent themselves, um, as well as how, um, how good the costume looks, for instance, how um, creative it is or, um, yeah, how finished it is. So what you see there is the sort of A division that those are the top groups um, of which the Saxons is one, but there are there are also um, a second division as well, B division, with kind of smaller groups, people who are maybe just making their way up through the carnival, and then you have um, free groups or, or scrap groups, and that's a way to just get on the parade route, and they might not have um, put nearly as much time into their costume, but it's a way to see the route and it's often um, a way to get a more political message across that they don't usually have as much uh, as much funding. So each, each group has its own very, very particular meaning. Um, and they're often other cultures um, or things that have been in the news or uh, religion. For instance, there's one group called um, Conquerors for Christ, and they they often take a religious theme. Okay, great, thank you. Oh, uh, we have a crash. Another question from Elena. Last yeah. question. Yes. That <laughs> <laughs> um, this film is in a bigger trilogy of works mm -hmm. around Montpellier, and I was wondering if um, they could speak about how this fits in to okay. those other. Okay. Uh, her question is: This film is part of a trilogy. Um, of works on John Canoe and how does it fit in with other works that you have done around this team? Yeah, so this is the third work in the trilogy and it sort of moves from looking at the individual um, to looking at the group and uh, place and environment and its effect on um, making in this final film. So the first film's called John Canoe Talk and um, it's just one costume basically and you don't really see the image of a of the uh, woman who wears it full on until uh, very uh, close to the end when you ca ca catch a glimpse of her. And I was very interested in thinking about the body and how um, the body enables us to speak and that might be through gesture or costume or um, performance and so I made a, a soundtrack for that made from sounds that I just made um, on my own body like claps and, um, and brushes and you see a costume very very close up the technique of cutting um, the crepe paper is this sort of fringing detail that you saw in and the film you watched today. So you see almost like forensically, like what is this thing um, that we're seeing that adorns the body that is this way of communicating. And then the second film 
it takes a bit more of a broad um, interest in carnival, Caribbean carnival as it's celebrated in the UK. It's called um, A Protest, A Celebration, A Mixed Message. And it's about being uh, mixed race also. And for me, growing up in, or biracial, if you're, um, depending on what term you prefer to use. And for me, it's about growing up in a very rural part of um, England and what that means for how I can celebrate what is my um, culture and kind of how absurd the image is of having this really detailed costume in a um, like English countryside landscape. Um, and it's contrasted with uh, Leeds Carnival, which is about 30 miles from where I grew up. Uh, Leeds is quite a major city in the north. And um, following one group in Leeds Carnival who have very political themes and their theme for that particular year was uh, the Windrush scandal, how a lot of um, migrants to the UK, Caribbean migrants, are now being um, denied their citizenship, basically. And some of them have been sent back to the Caribbean and some of them have never really lived lives in the Caribbean so they that they have no family or no real contacts to kind of start a life there um even though they were granted um indefinite leave uh, to remain all all the way back in the whenever they came um as a Windrush generation so uh, again, with a political message and thinking about the kinds of um, tensions between spectating and, and performing um, in a in a British sense. And then this is the final film in the trilogy. So going back to the Caribbean, um, to the Bahamas and seeing um, the contrast, I suppose, and how it's not, it's not really like how we celebrate um, Caribbean carnivals in the UK at all so yeah okay great do we have any questions oh oh sorry uh, oh, alex have... yes um, so i am interested in hearing you talk about um how you compose the sound for this mm -hmm. film mm -hmm. um the different sort of like layering and um and sort of yeah how you conceived of the soundscape and the maybe the interviews you conducted or the narration um and also the the music and score Okay, so her question is about the sound, how you compose the sound, um, the soundscapes, and perhaps um, the different soundscapes. You see analog sounds, we see, of course, space image sounds. Perhaps we could talk a bit about the selection of the sounds for the film. Yeah, so I'm very interested in sampling as a technique or an aesthetic to um, that is particularly good for talking about. Um, my identity or a multiracial identity, let's say, like perhaps a diasporic condition is something which is um, very much amenable to being mixed and remixed and sampled. So there are a lot of different sources um, in the work. So that the, the only real sound which relates directly to the images that you're seeing is the sounds of the carnival mm. itself or of Junkanu itself and uh, some interviews with people who make costumes um, in the shacks there, in the Saxons, uh, the group I was following. The rest of the sounds are um, imposing this kind of idea of space and technology. Um, so you hear the sounds of uh, from the European Space Agency and uh, the Mars rover and machinery being tested. You hear also, as I was saying before, the analog sounds of like radios um, tuning, the idea of um, message sending, which isn't quite getting there or is somehow mediated was something I really wanted to communicate because that's how the uh, costumes are kind of spread around the world. It's through, it's through photographs, it's through watching um, it on television, on the internet. 
Um, and so I wanted to communicate that through the sounds. Um, and also the idea that there's this voice, which is um, scripted, uh, coming to you from the telephone, so from somewhere else. Um, so it's a lot, it's, it's all about locating and uh, dislocating <laughs> the viewer. Yeah, definitely. Um, do we have any questions from the Zoom? I have a question. Oh, another question, yes? Yeah? To the carnival with what's going to be great. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and so, two things when I was a film, I couldn't really like the children, also dancing to the adults. Mm -hmm. And I knew that children being separate, um, something that was okay. Love, what that children to be together. And then, lastly, when I wrote this, when I had one, you know, the children being great, other people around the country. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, there's a question uh, from the audience here about the carnival. Um, she, um, she said her first introduction to the carnival was a West Indian parade in Brooklyn. And she saw that there was this interaction of children with adults in the film that she found pretty significant. And wondering if this perhaps occurs frequently, this sort of interaction with the children, with adults, and perhaps again, looking at um, the West Indian um, parade, Bahamas was not represented. She's curious about why you think that is perhaps taking place, Bahamas not represented in the Brooklyn West Indian parade as well. So two questions there um, about if you want me to repeat or if you. Uh, that's OK. Uh, yeah. Um, maybe when I get halfway through, if I get lost. Um, <laughs> so the intergenerational thing. Well, a lot of the choreographed dancers tend to be uh, younger women. So there's a the kind of layout of the group. Uh, means that they're sort of free dancers and there'll be a big float at the beginning. Um, the music is always at the back. And then in the middle, there'll be choreographed dancers. And then there'll be the bigger costumes, which can't really be choreographed because they don't really fit as well. They don't allow as much movement. Um, so they'll just kind of be um, doing less elaborate mm -hmm. gestures. And so there is a bit of a gender divide in that the choreographed part is usually like younger women and the big heavier costumes um, are often worn by men. So I think in that way, there's kind of an age difference there often. But Junkanoo is used as a way to get younger people interested in something and keep them out of trouble as well. Junkanoo and sports, um, especially too. So in that sense, you'll learn the techniques of making Junkanoo and learn, um, you know, the um, the choreography and things from when you're smaller and you'll grow up through the ranks as, um, as you get more proficient at making or dancing or whatever. So, there is a sort of like intergenerational like passing on of knowledge. Uh, one of the people that I interviewed in the Davis family, their father was on contract, so he was making costumes. Other people would pay him to make costumes for them. Um, and he had his own shack and then he had his sons and his like family all coming around the shack, all working in the shack, seeing what he was doing and learning the skills from him as well. So in that way, it is something that's passed um, down and across generations. There's also like, it's such a fierce rivalry between the groups that, um, so for instance, my uh, cousins who are just a bit older than me, um, they support one team and then the older members of my family support another team. So <laughs> they're kind of, uh, there's kind of a rivalry between them too. So yeah, it's like it's like any other game really. It brings people up through or, or sport, it brings people up through the ranks and people support different teams and 
it's kind of a sense of belonging by um, supporting a certain group or um, following the way that your family or your friends follow. Um, and shacks are also arranged by territory often. So quite often it'll depend where you've grown up to uh, which group that you would support. Um, yeah, and the second question, I've forgotten it, <laughs> sorry. The second question is about representation. Um, the West Indian Parade in Brooklyn, there have not oh, yeah. been, yeah. But here, yeah. the Bahamas was not, yeah, represented. So I guess this is one of the questions that I wanted to ask in the film. Um, you have to get special passes to go on the parade route. And um, I was there with my dad picking these passes up on the day before Junkanoo. And there were other photographers there too. And we kind of asked them about like what they were making and things and where their photographs would go. and. Um, some of them were saying like we don't see them um, move internationally enough um, almost as if well it is a missed opportunity because tourism is such a huge industry it's one of the biggest industries um, alongside banking in the Bahamas and it would probably generate quite a bit of income to be able to um, and bring people to the Bahamas to be able to um, sort of disseminate those images um, further afield than they are. Um, so it was a kind of lingering question that I don't think I've really found the answer to was what, why don't these images circulate more widely and where are we seeing them end up um, after the parade? Because there are plenty of people who are professionally photographing um, Junkanoo. And so, yeah, it's hard. But the Bahamas, like, comparative to, say, Trinidad or Jamaica, is very small. And so even here in the UK, um, to give an idea, the High Commission has a sort of event every Independence Day, every year, and the number of people that attend will fit in like a large event space. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I mean, I guess there's more people in um, the US, more Bahamians in the US, especially because it's so close. But um, compared to other Caribbean countries, I guess it's just not that large. Other than that, I, I wouldn't really like to say. <laughs> okay. Okay, we have oh, we have another question, I guess. <laughs> Two more questions. <laughs> uh, who'd like to go first? Okay. I'm just curious more about how these like, radical parts of the Black imagination. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we have a question from our interim chair from Black and Latino Studies. Uh, she. The question is uh, from Shelley Eversley, Dr. Eversley. How do you conceive of the Black radical in this film? Imagination. imagination, sorry, black radical imagination. <laughs> How do you see it? And what's the radical part as well? So I'm very interested in uh, Robin Kelly and his book, Freedom Dreams, The Black Radical Imagination. And it's something that I'm writing about a lot now. I'm doing a PhD on um, black radical imagination and a black aesthetic and how it's realized through analog filmmaking practices. So I'm very interested in black radical imagination um, from the get-go. But the way that I think that it should apply to Carnival is thinking about the way that its history and the way that it uses and transforms space and that space is uh, something which it confines us, which um, determines how we live our lives and that carnivals enact this kind of freedom in space and this occupying of um, public streets. Uh, so the history of Junkanoo is that it was supposedly first, um, it first happened as it was the day off 
for slaves, which would, or the enslaved, which would happen on um, Boxing Day, Christmas Day, New Year's Day. And that's when it's held now, Boxing Day, New Year's Day. And they would collect scraps of paper throughout the year and then um, have a kind of festival and make costumes from whatever they collected. And so it has its roots in a um, political kind of resistance, a, a freedom that they got only three days of the year. Um, but now you can see that it ends in uh, Rawson Square and Parliament Square, which is where uh, government is, and it's where, well, the Senate is, and it's where um, historically the uh, PLP uh, took power, which was basically the people taking power from um, a lot of white men who had been running the country. And so I don't think that's coincidence that uh, the carnival happens there. You know, it's at the site of um, political triumph. Um, and so I'd say in that way, it's radical. But I also wanted to concentrate on the aesthetics of something that's radical in the realm of art making, that this is a way of making things which um, should be thought of as really innovative and at the forefront of um, perhaps costume or sculpture. The costumes have to be very, very light in order for them to be carried. Nothing can be um, motorised. And so because crepe paper can't just be stuck on, um, they've recently, in recent years, invented a machine that will pulverise crepe paper and spray it onto um, the costume, the body of the costume. I think it's those kinds of innovations that should be um, considered as avant-garde practice okay. or radical practice. Bahamas. Bahamas. Yeah. Bahamas and Bahamas. They're very So they are outside the Mediterranean part of the life happening in New York. Jamaica, and that little country. Mm -hmm. Bahamas, Bahamas are not a country. Oh, well, um, oh, okay. Uh, the question is about Bahamas, um, and it's still being a colony, a colony of Britain, and whether or not um, it's different from countries like Trinidad and Jamaica, um, who have, I guess, moved away from that colonial past. Um, so in terms of that, right, how, how do you see that past or the fact that they are still a colony, how does that impact the, the space of the carnival? I don't think that people in the Bahamas are thinking about the Bahamas as a colony um, really at all. Like you saw the um you saw the float which said Bahamian and proud. I think there's a much more um much more of a Bahamian sentiment than there would be for for Britain. I mean there are sometimes floats, um carnival themes, junkanoo themes that uh give kind of tribute to the Queen and I guess this kind of reverence for British things somewhat still continues. I think me having an English accent really changes the way that I engage with people um, in the Bahamas and who I'm with, whether I'm with my mum or my dad, um, really changes how I engage with people and that has to do with um, sounding English or or British, let's say. But I think Bahamians are really proud to be Bahamian, and they're not really thinking about themselves as a as a colony in relationship to the Queen. There might be 
maybe remnants of those of those ideas, but they they did gain independence in the seventies. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, definitely. It's still an independent country. It gained its Bahamas. They gained oh, the Bahamas gave it independence. So that's important to note as well. I'm curious about the time frame of this project. I'm thinking about how long it perhaps took to bring the Saxons to life. If you could talk a bit about the time frame of this project. Oh gosh. <laughs> um, well, firstly, the carnival, or I should say, Junkanoo, because Bahamas would not call it a carnival at all. Um, <laughs> Junkanoo itself um, lasts from, it starts around 10 p.m. more or less, and it will go all the way through the night into the morning. So in that sense, you're faced with the kind of dilemma of what should I film? <laughs> There's so much going on. And you don't want to have, as I had, like eight hours of... <laughs> Um, footage how do you pick one over the other it's very difficult um, so firstly I think if I'd actually been doing all of that capturing of the footage on the film it would have been so much better because I'd been very limited but this bit was done digitally so um, I didn't really edit as I as I went and so the actual editing process took about a year off and on because I wanted to revisit um, and piece all of the, there's lots of different elements in this film, I piece them all together in a way which makes sense, which is quite hard to do in kind of retrospectively in the edit as a, and, and make a um, coherent narrative. And so the voiceover kind of does that for me. It kind of pieces um, this line through where things are made, how are they performed? How are they archived? Yeah, definitely. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Okay, uh, Lena has a question. <laughs> we're in an academic space, so we're all here. And I was wondering if she could just tease us a little bit about the PhD research. Okay, uh, so she has a question <laughs> about your PhD research. If you could tell us a bit about more about your, your research project. Yeah, so it's uh, practice-based, and so I am making a film on 16 millimeter film that's at Caribbean centres, and it's asking them about their space and how their space is funded. And um, I really want to show how having a physical space is important to being able to organise this community, and that aesthetics are instrumental in how you engage with um, the people that you're working with, the people that you're filming, how you produce community. So for example, um, the fact that I'm using 16 millimeter film and people can't see their image and I can't see their image apart from what I see when I look through the eyepiece. Um, how does that affect the way that we relate to each other? How does the fact that um, there isn't much light available for the light that film stocks will record um, affect how I interact with people? I had to go, for instance, to a Christmas dinner recently at a Caribbean association and film it. And um, I put a light on top of my analog film camera and basically it turned me into a club photographer and suddenly people were engaging me with me in this way which was something that I could take a picture of them that they could then have and they would be able to see instantly and I had to say say no it, it's analog it has to be developed and so they're posing in this way that is very much of a, a, a digital era but their images are rendered in analog and I'm interested in those kind of um dis dis disconnections or making um the fact that technology is influencing how I relate to a community very very clear um 
yeah so that's just a bit of what I've been been doing but I'm looking at Robin Kelly and black arts movement and then 80s um workshops in the UK and how they facilitated a, a whole um array of, of black artists to make films with hardly any conditions as to what the aesthetic had to be or how they had to be um how they had to be made so yeah I'm halfway through <laughs> Okay, so could you tell us a bit about what you want the viewers to take away, walk away with after viewing this project? Um, perhaps altered ideas, curiosities, or sensibilities? Yeah, I like people to think about the, um, the spatial aspects of Carnival. Um, I said a bit about my other film um, that was in Leeds, and one central question. So that film is, are black performers being sort of thrust into this limelight without any control or do they have agency over the way that their images are being um, used? And so I'm interested in that kind of spectator performance space, especially for women, um, especially for black women. Um, who kind of run throughout the three films, there's definitely a focus on them. So I'd like people to think about the space, but also how is Caribbean cultures in particular, how are they being archived? Okay, great. And I turn to you, how do you walk away uh, from this <laughs> in terms of new projects, ideas? How has the creation of this this film altered your own sensibilities or shifted your sensibilities, curiosities and ideas, perhaps about Junkanoo or the, the space of Junkanoo itself? Oh, that's difficult. No one ever asked me that before. Um, <laughs> I think perhaps... I've sort of cemented my interest in finding images which are not the norm. I didn't want to create a like a, a traditional documentary of Junkanoo. Um, it was more interesting to me how the form could speak to the idea of being overwhelmed or the sensations of, of Junkanoo. I think, yeah, I guess I learned that um, like the bodily experience of um, my culture, of how I experience the world is is really important to me. And I, I need a way uh, or a language to be able to um, communicate that through the images that I make. Yeah, definitely. Thanks so much. So we will end there. If the audience has any questions, I don't, okay. But this was such a great discussion. It's so informative. We learned so much about Junkanoo. And again, I was able to draw connections between my culture, Trinidad, Carnival, and Junkanoo. And this, again, this film really, really captured the essence of Junkanoo. And I, I'm sure all of us are more aware now and informed of Junkanoo and its sort of cultural significance for the Bohemians as well. So thank you. Thank you so much for, again, your work and discussing the film. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and being you know, it's like watching the film and engaging um, with my work. It's been so great to be able to, yeah, to speak about it again. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>